Katie Hefner's plan to move her aging mother into her home with her teenage daughter and live happily ever after in multi-generational bliss didn't exactly work out that way. Her memoir, Mother, Daughter, Me, explores the year she and her mother spent working through and triumphing over a lifetime of unresolved emotions. Please join me in welcoming Katie Hafner to the JCCSF. Hello. Well, hello. Nice Thank you for here. being here. Yeah, here I am. And you wanted to, before we get started. Oh, right, the notebook. So um, this is one thing I've started doing is uh, I actually started doing this at book clubs, and it it was so amazing that I decided to um, buy a notebook and start sending it around. Uh, if everyone wouldn't mind, uh, just write one word to describe your mother uh, <laughs> on this page. And you can see, and you can get ideas from previous, <laughs> previous pages. Um, and so Andy's going to send it around, and then at the end we're going to read the list aloud. Uh, so. Don't hold back. <laughs> and you can do, you can take two words if you want, or hyphenate it, or whatever. If, you know. The scary thing is, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about my mother, but I'm also thinking what my son would write about me. That's the scary part. Well. A anyway, mm -hmm. let's start in, Katie, by talking about the challenge of being a journalist who turns the lens on herself which is what you did in this book. Tell us about that. Wow, you're and really jumping right in. I'm jumping in. I'm jumping in. Okay, well, I'm a journalist. Uh, I write, um, I've been a journalist for 30-something years, and uh, I write narrative, I write, you know, stories, and uh, narrative nonfiction books. This is my sixth book, and I'm not at all accustomed to writing anything personal ever. I, when I was working at the New York Times Circuit section, I wrote one piece once about buying a rug online and it felt, I felt exposed, <laughs> like too much, too much personal information. So I it think was, I read that piece. <laughs> yeah, I know. So many people have said, I read that piece. Like a woman from Book Passage who uh, was at an event, she said, I read that piece. So, um, uh, and I, and I don't mean to sound coy about this or, you know, how, you know, people say, oh, I didn't mean to write this book, but this really was an accidental book. Um, so I was uh, not, I've written about a wide range of things, everything from, you know, reunified Germany to Glenn Gould's love affair with his piano to the history of the internet. So I'm talking really objective distance. And, uh, and... Um, I had no plans to write a book about this. And my mother, um, in 2009, she went into a crisis. It wasn't so much a health crisis as a life crisis in uh, San Diego. She was living in San Diego. I have to give you background. No, no, I want it. And, um, and, uh, and my daughter and I, uh, my daughter was 15 turning 16. We had lost her dad when he was um, 45. My daughter was eight. And... Zoe and I had gotten incredibly close. And we were living in San Francisco, right on Broderick at, um, uh, and Washington. And, and, uh, and my mother went into this crisis and I f said, oh, move in with us. And it was total fairy tale, magical thinking totally delusional like I just thought we'd be skipping through the daisies and there was this small little kind of footnote that I didn't know her really very well because I had been taken away from her when I was 10 uh, she had been an alcoholic and my sister and I were taken away from mm -hmm. her um, when I was 10 my sister was 12 and we were raised by my father um, and his new wife and her three children and um, that was kind of a mess. But anyway, uh, so I thought, I just had this vision, this fairy tale vision of, and I think that this is probably the case with children of alcoholics, is that you, you fantasize about the nuclear family you could have, and that is exactly what I did. And so she, my mother, was just as optimistic about it as I was, so she, um, 
So she moved to San Francisco and moved in with Zoe and me, and it was an unmitigated disaster. After two hours, I knew that this was <laughs> going to be a mess. It was, you know, we we were so optimistic about it that we talked about it. We called it our our year in Provence, which quickly turned into a few weeks in purgatory and then full-blown hell. So wait a minute. <laughs> but so you went from, in your story, your mother was an alcoholic and you were taken away from her. But... Over the years before she moved in, you developed a nice telephone relationship. A tel a te okay, note that word. <laughs> <laughs> operative word, telephone relationship. I mean, we saw each other, actually, and, you know, and she's really smart, and she's funny, and I enjoy her, and um, that's what gave me all. And also, I didn't understand boundaries. We'll talk about that more, but I didn't understand boundaries, and I, I confided in her in ways that were probably, like, just too much. Anyway... She moves in, and it's a mess. And I didn't realize that I had all this bitterness that I, in fact, had. Uh, you know, friends of mine would say, oh, you know, I had a terrible childhood. And I'd say, oh, mine was no day at the beach. Get over it. <laughs> and I thought, if I can move on, you know, you can too. And when she moved in, it was clear that it was that I had just all this anger. So. We, this is getting up to, you know, why I wrote about it. So um, we decided actually to go see a therapist. And you know how in California there's like every possible brand of therapist. And how's this for a therapy niche? Uh, we found a woman in Berkeley who Naturally. Helps, yes, of course. <laughs> who helps. Or Sacramento Street. That's another Right, 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 right. Um, so uh, she specializes in helping elderly people move not mind you, not in with, but near their adult children. And so this woman, like, she was in way over her head from the start. My mother and I walk in with, you know, 40-something years of undealt with baggage. And uh, I realized after that one session that I was really angry. And we go to this Trader Joe's, the one in El Cerrito, and she is reaching up to get a half gallon of lactate from a high shelf and instead of doing what a normal, decent person would do uh, and help her get the lactate off the shelf, I turned my back and pretended I didn't notice that she was struggling. And I thought to myself, oh my God. You know that scene in Downton Abbey where you know O'Brien puts the soap by Cora's bathtub <laughs> and she then looks in the mirror and she goes, Sarah O'Brien, this is not who you are? I thought... This is not who I am, but it, it was what I was doing. And so I went home, uh, I couldn't sleep that night, and I thought either this will kill me or I'll write about it. So I got up, I wrote that scene, that Trader Joe's scene, and then I wrote uh, these paragraphs that I call the us paragraphs about how close Zoe and I were, and I started, and I sent it around first to friends, and then to my agent, and he said, you know, this is a book. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and amazingly enough, um, because I'm a classic mid-list author. Um, and Describe what that means to people who don't know. <laughs> I was know. afraid you were going to No, but I, it's, it's a book publishing term. It's so a book publishing it. term. And it means that I am, you know, I'm not John Grisham. I'm not, you know, you know. Th um, At the top. At the top, I'm I'm classic mid list. You know, that's like, you know, that the publishers I was with Simon and Schuster for years. They can't live with you. They can't live without you. Um, Ingrid knows who the. <laughs> Hello, Ingrid. Uh, and amazingly enough, uh, twelve publishers wanted this book, which is uh, just because it struck such a chord. It's a sandwich generation book. It's. Um, and it was sort of written, the proposal was written straight from the heart. And so, um, so Random House made a preemptive bid, and I went with Random House, and then I thought, and I thought, oh, easy, you know, because these books I write, they take like three, four years. There's a ton of research. The Germany book took, you know, forever, and, uh, and you know, the six people who read it really liked it. <laughs> and, and, then the Glenn Gould book, you know, that was another three or four years. They take, you know, it's all this plotting research. And I thought, oh, great, no research. You know, this will be, you know, no time at all. It took me, like, no time to write the proposal. And 
It was the hardest thing I've ever done because I'm used to looking, you know, from the outside into other people. You know how Janet Malcolm says, you know, journalists are the, you know, they're just the ultimate con men and women. And because what you do as a journalist is you give a little bit of yourself and you get a lot back. And you don't write about yourself. You write about the person you're interviewing. And, um, and I, uh, when I wrote the first draft, I just thought it was great. And it was horrible. It was... Um, why, because there wasn't enough of you in it, or well, why? <laughs> it was like this book written about this woman named Katie Hafner by this journalist named Katie Hafner, and there was absolutely no link between the two. And so you still had the distance. Oh yeah, I had no clue what you know why I uh, had was doing what I was doing when my mother moved in. I was very, as I mentioned, I was very cruel to her, and this cruel side of me came out, and I didn't understand it, and uh, I didn't understand why I let my daughter also be um, mean to her grandmother, and also I just didn't get anything. And so, if you're kind of a like normal you know, schmo like me, and you write a memoir, you know, you have to be absolutely certain if, um, I mean, even celebrities, you know, there's only so much appetite among readers for every little diary entry of a celebrity. And so some of the stuff I was writing was just so unbearably diary-like with no reflection and no analysis that it's like, who would want to read this? And so unless you're going to resonate in a, you know, unless you're going to resonate in some way with you, it, touching on universal themes, I mean, mother, that's a big one, um, and understand what you're doing in a way that readers get it, but also be honest, because there's this, th there's this notion in literature called the unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Gone Girl, and you should have known. I mean, yeah, right. And there's some very popular novels that right. Are so if you, way. as the narrator, are uh, if the if the reader thinks that you are not coming clean, 100% clean, then they'll put the book down, and they'll. I think they'll get disgusted pretty. Quickly. I mentioned it when we were talking earlier, Jeanette Walls, and I don't know how many of you have read The Glass Castle, but she comes clean, and it's painful. But but before we talk more generally, I want to ask you to read from the book because you mentioned the the us part of the book, and the us part of the book has to do with you and your daughter Zoe, who at the time was 15 years old and was going to take part in this fabulous year in Provence that right. wasn't experiment. So why don't you give us a little <laughs> taste of it? Right. Right, exactly. So, um, exactly. So, this is about um, this is about Zoe and me, <clears throat> and it's right when I ask Zoe. Basically, I ask her permission to have her grandmother move in with us. Zoe was quiet and fr and fanned out the index cards in her hand. Then she said, "I think she should come live with us. That would be nice." I was relieved. At that moment, encouraged by my daughter's easy acquiescence, I chose to disregard the risks. I knew my mother was free with her opinions, that she took up a lot of psychological space in a room, and that she and Zoe hadn't exactly bonded over the years. I also knew that Zoe was a teenager living the full complement of her age group's psychodramas. And then there was the fact that I was working hard to make a living, and this new arrangement could be a distraction. But I wasn't aspiring to turn us into the Huxtables. I was just trying to take these remnants of a family and weave them together as best I could. After a few more minutes, Zoe asked, so if Grandma Helen lives with us, what will happen to us? I knew exactly what she meant. For the past eight years, since the day Matt, her father, died suddenly of a heart attack at age 45, Zoe and I have been tiptoeing together through life. We've grown remarkably close. Zoe doesn't simply tell me everything. She entrusts me with her fragile heart, much as her father did. Other mothers say they envy me, but I wouldn't wish on anyone the circumstances that bound my, my daughter to me this tightly. Since Matt's death, Zoe has worried that I too will die, leaving her an orphan. More than once I've awakened in the middle of the night to see my daughter's eyes large in the dark, inches from my head, 
checking to make sure I'm breathing. So the us she was referring to was the us that had managed to get her through the past eight years without her father, the us that saw her through the grief of losing him, the us that struggled through my disastrous remarriage to a man who first embraced, then rejected his, his stepdaughter with breathtaking completeness. It was the us that emerged on the other side of all that, a unit as close as two wounded people can be. But she also meant the everyday us, the us that flips through her old art cards, the us that goes to In-N-Out Burger on a whim when nothing else will do, the us that watches Desperate Housewives every single Sunday night no matter what, the us that loves to listen to Christmas music in the car year-round, we're Jewish, especially <laughs> Eartha Kitt singing Santa Baby. How would my mother fit into that us? My answer to her was that we wouldn't be any less us than we ever were. Zoe and I knew how to be a family. Now we would have a chance to show my mother what we knew, to show her the true meaning of family, to show what I had to learn on my own without her. You know, the really interesting thing about this, besides its specific application to you and Zoe and your mother, anybody who has a child and is divorced, for example, and thinks about entering into another relationship with whomever goes through this same thing. I mean, because well, you get... Well, if you're smart, you do. If you're well, me, you do. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you get very tight, and you become two, and you become... The, you're the team against the world in adversity, and you're also together in the beautiful times, and for somebody else to enter in and create a triangle, I mean, this is the part that has universal application. Right, I know, uh, it's so true. I mean, that your re my relationship with Zoe was, you know, it was just, it was so tight that I wasn't, I didn't give enough thought to what, introducing my mother into this mix. And what uh, was Zoe's be. relationship like with your mother before? Very strained. You know, my mother, um, they'd never really had much to say to each other. My mother is, she's a great conversationalist, but not with children. So... Because um, your mother was a very erudite person. Oh my gosh, my yeah. mother is brilliant. She had gone to Radcliffe, she was a physicist. She dropped out at age 19 to marry my father. And they got stuck with these two little kids in Rochester, New York. And, you know, this was an era. This was, um, I mean, I talk about this a lot when I talk about the book, is that the era my mother lived in, which was um, the 50s. Uh, so she drops out of Radcliffe, marries my father, also a physicist, has these two little children, moves to Rochester, New York, where it is freezing. And she's like raising these two little kids. And I don't know about you guys, but you know, it can be really boring, like playing flight attendant for the 15th time that day. <laughs> and so that's what my mother was uh, dealing with. And then it was the era of the cocktail hour. And she could not wait for that five o'clock bell to ring. Mm -hmm. And that was what she was up against. And but she, on top of that, I think she, you know, the fact that she and Zoe never established, she just doesn't have that kind of sort of, kind of warm bosom-like thing going. Which Zoe's other grandmother did yes, in space. Yes, absolutely, yeah, in space. So, um, you, when you talk about um, what went wrong, part of it has to do with your unresolved feelings about, oh, I know what I was going to ask, excuse me, I want to go back a minute. When you and your mother started confronting what was going wrong, you became aware that your mother, because of alcoholic blackouts or whatever, simply did not remember a lot of what had happened in your childhood. So the things that were so painful to you, she had no idea. I know. It, well, that's, it's such a good question. I mean, we had never, ever discussed. I mean, we were taken away from her from one day to the next. There was no warning at all. Uh, we were just gone from San Diego and didn't go back. And for years, we had never, ever discussed it. Once, once we had, I had started to broach it. 
um, when Zoe was like five and um, you know how when your kids are little you're going through their massive volumes of artwork and you're trying to decide you know what should I save what's this kid gonna really care about after you know when they're 20 or whatever whenever I turn this stuff over to them and so I was going through all Zoe's artwork and I thought to myself and I and I thought where's where's my stuff where's my stuff so I was talking to my mother, one of our telephone calls, and I said, Where's, what happened to my stuff? And that was the m closest I ever got to bringing it up with her. So it wasn't until we got to the therapist in Berkeley that it came up. In fact, she, this therapist, she had one of those rolling office chairs, and she was so scared of her own question, she rolled away from us. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, I think there's a past here we need to talk about. And so... I s my mother started to tell the story. The scene is in the book. My mother starts to tell the story of what happened. and With you being taken away? Yeah, and she's getting it all wrong. It's like she had our ages wrong. I mean, not to even know how old your own children were when they were taken away. She didn't know that we were taken away to live somewhere. She thought we had just gone someplace for a visit. And uh, I start to correct her, and then I think, you know what, I want to see where she's going with this. So she tells the story, very abbreviated version, and I then started to tell the story, and I just start sobbing. And I don't even really cry much. And I'm just sitting there sobbing, and shes I tell the whole story of what happened. And she's sitting there, and it's like it's the first time she's ever heard it. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, don't forget that, you know, the, this is true what you say. It, she was, the, her life in that period was one big cognitive blackout, memory blackout, and... Um, that's what alcohol does to you. And uh, she sat there and she just said, Katie, I am so sorry. And to think what it took for her yeah. to say that. So, so back to the therapy for a moment. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> tell us more and um, could you, would it have been possible for someone else another therapist to have helped you more effectively. Tell us, because I'm sure a lot of people going through something like this, not exactly yeah. like yours, think, oh, I'll go and get some help. So give me your general well, thoughts on that. I mean, that. I independently, it wasn't until I wrote this book that I actually had some real therapy. In fact, my best therapist was my editor. You know how in, in, in Microsoft Word, the insert comment thing, you know, <laughs> and usually, and usually in, you know, when you're going through the editorial process, it's like, well, you know, I'm not sure this sentence really flows and we might want to rethink this paragraph placement or maybe this chapter. But she would say, she would write things like, what the hell were you thinking when you let, you know, Zoe say that to your mother? So that was really good and a couple of other key people. But the therapist therapist in Berkeley, she was in totally over her head. But don't forget that my mother, who was very generously agreed to do this, uh, couldn't. I mean, she was also, that we're talking about a generation. Right. Post-World War II, I mean, they had other things to think about, you know. Uh, and, and she said to me at one point, she said, you know, this was after one of the therapy sessions, I think I prefer the unexamined life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a what the hell, I had two what the hell were you thinking moments when I read this book. One of them was, your mother has moved in with you. You know your mother loves her birthday. Her birthday is really a big deal for her. So you decide to have a book party for someone Aye. else on your mother's <laughs> birthday and invite your mother to it. And I'm reading this book going, she's smart. She wrote for the New York Times. What the hell was she thinking? Yeah, so you bad. were in a zone. I was in this sort of yeah. passive-aggressive thing I was doing. And also... I mean, everything, by the way, took place right in this neighborhood. I mean, a lot of it, there are many deleted scenes from the JCC. And <laughs> you, you might all be in it, too. You yeah. never know. <laughs> and in fact, you know how in movies, uh, deleted scenes, you're watching the deleted scenes, and you're, and, and you're thinking, uh, yeah, gosh, yeah, I can see why that was a hard choice to delete that scene. And you can see, you hear the director's voiceover saying, yeah, I was really in love with this scene, but it really was too redundant with another. But with a lot of this book, it was like, oh, no, that really needed to go. And so I had these scenes. So 
so I'm saying this about my mother's birthday because I was up and down Sacramento Street trying to, you know, buying orchids for her and this and thinking and chocolate birthday cards and then, and she joined the JCC like right away. And um, so I had these scenes in the book about the Friday lunch, which was actually hilarious because all the people who come with their Tupperware and start putting, I guess I shouldn't be saying that. That's anyway, fine. Right? <laughs> these elderly people. And then they offered her all these pats of margarine that she had. <laughs> she said, I don't know why these people were giving me this margarine. And then, because she's completely new to San Francisco. And then we were in these exercise dance classes together. And, uh, and that was hilarious, but completely not for the book. There's one JCC scene that's still in there. But yeah, um, so the birthday, you know, a lot of people, uh, it, birthdays take on outsized significance, I think. Absolutely. And uh, in my family, for some reason, even more sort of outsized, beyond outside significance. Well, there were two other, um, I mean, when, when there were, there's a lot that went wrong, as you've said, but one, <laughs> I mean, no surprise, but one thing that was really an issue and came up explicitly and uh, sort of under the surface over and over again had to do with money. So talk about money in your relationship to your mother. And Oi. <coughs> so, well, um, so money, as a lot of people here, I'm sure, can relate to, money can be a symbol of so much more uh, in families. And... Uh, you, and so often, you know, when when someone dies, you know, the the armoire, this sort of not even valuable but somehow meaningful armoire takes on all this significance. And my mother uh, uh, was that way, not with so much with objects, but with but always had had a troubled relationship with money because, and this is a huge theme in the book. I touch on a lot of what um, uh, what is, uh, I thought I had just discovered it, but apparently it's a whole field of psychotherapy, um, multi-generational trauma. Um, and it's a, it's a huge, um, it's a huge problem for many f dysfunctional families. And my mother, so um, my mother had suffered greatly at the hands of her parents who were extremely wealthy. They were this, the worst combination of brilliant scientists who were also terrible people. And uh, actually some people say, well, so what's new? And, um, and they were very wealthy and they had tortured her with money. And so of course, you know, there was this, um, I mean, they owned an entire part of an island off Cape Cod, which they then sold off and donated to Harvard and MIT and left my mother with very, 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 li with actually this real torture, which was a trust, one of these skipping generation trusts, and she had to live off the, off the interest from the trust. And all of this was very much of a smack in the face for her. And I think it was just, uh, so that became an issue for her and at one point, she, we're at the therapist, and this was um, pretty late in our disastrous experiment, and she announces to the therapist and to me for the first time that she believes I have brought her to San Francisco for her money. And it's like, what money? <laughs> and uh, that was a shock to me. And yet, when you dig deep into what someone has been through you understand much better how they behave. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to let her off the hook for that. I just have to. There is, um, the kitchen also plays a big part. A kitchen, power struggles, in case we all didn't know that, happen in kitchens a lot. And the kitchen plays a big part in this tension between you and your mother. And I think there's another section of the book that you're going to read from that has right. something to do with the so kitchen. So I'm going to read this section that... Um, uh, is about my mother and me. So what happened was Zoe and I were living in a little apartment on Broderick, as I said, and there wasn't, when I asked my mother to move in with me, there wasn't enough room in that little place for all three of us. So we uh, rented a really nice um, big house around the corner, one of those lovely tall Victorians, which of course um, had been built for multiple generations 
to live in. In fact, skeptical friends, you know, all the friends who knew about my childhood, even those who didn't, would say, what are you doing? I'd say, oh, no, no, it's fine. You know, Zoe and I will have our bedrooms on the top floor. And then my mother has this <coughs> kind of low ground level quarters. And then the middle floor I called the buffer floor. And um, they said, yeah, buffer floor. Anyway, so uh, that meant that we had to blend, you know, all our household items. And so this is um, the scene in the kitchen uh, where uh, we are unpacking boxes. My mother and I choose to distract ourselves with what surrounds us in the here and now, several dozen boxes filled with kitchenware. I usually enjoy setting up a new kitchen, but this has become a joyless and highly charged task. My mother and I each have our own set of kitchen boxes, which means that if there are two cheese graters between us, only one will make it into a cupboard. The other will be put back in a box or given to goodwill. Each such little decision has the weight of a Middle East negotiation. <laughs> At first, it was fine enough. As we put away bowls and plates, salad servers and toast tongs, my mother turned to me and said, undiluted joy in her voice, we're co-mingling. I shuddered, perhaps even panicked, which is why I've now turned churlish. While her kitchenware is serviceable, I'm a sucker for the high end. All clad saucepans and a meal en riz pie dishes. Before long, I'm shaking my head at pretty much everything my mother removes from her San Diego boxes. She takes each rejected item as a personal slight, which in fact, it is. I begrudge her even her lightweight bowls, which she can lift easily with her injured hand. I'm determined to stake my claim as the expert at equipping and running a kitchen, which is, after all, the focal point of domestic life. But there's something else at work, too. Here she is, a fragile old woman barely able to bend down as she peers into a low cupboard looking for a place where she can share life with her grown daughter. At such a sight, my heart should be big, but it's small. So small that when I see her start stuffing her serving spoons into the same drawer as my own sturdy pieces, lovingly accumulated over the years, it makes me crazy. Suddenly, I'm acting out decades of unvoiced anger about my mother's parenting, which seems to be materializing in the form of her makeshift collection of kitchenware being unpacked into the drawers. When I became a mother myself, I developed a self-righteous sense of superiority to my mother. I was better than my mother for having successfully picked myself up and dusted myself off, for never having lain in bed for days on end to blotto to get my child off to school, or even to know if it was a school day. By sheer force of will and strength of character, I believed. I had risen above all that she succumbed to, and skirted all that I might have inherited. This, of course, is too obnoxiously smug to say in words. So, I say it with flatware. <laughs> you are very hard on yourself. Oh, my God, that's what my editor said. Well, what? don't you think when you read that? I mean, don't you... Well, look at my behavior. Why is that hard on myself? <laughs> um, it's just interesting to me hearing when you first wrote the book, you were detached, and then you went back in and became more reflective. Um, you certainly well, did. <laughs> I actually, I don't think that's exactly what it was. I mean, w the first drafts of the book were as observant as this with no understanding. So through the book, I try to bring some understanding to this behavior. I mean, I have some classic, I mean, it sounds cliche, but I have some classic child of alcoholism behavior, which and this is to show you how out of it I am. I had never even been to Al-Anon, ever. It never occurred to me that I should go. I didn't think I had any th reason to go. And um, so th it's a different, this is pure observation, I think, um, without a whole lot of analysis except maybe at the end. Hmm. Um, and so that was the big trouble with the book at the beginning, is it was just re reporting what happened which is fine unless you want people to actually read the book. Um, as long as we're bringing up uh, the difficult stuff, let's talk about the piano. The piano, <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
Do you, I, I, a lot of you have read the book? Yeah, so you know. But for those who haven't. I want to know what you guys think about the for piano. For those, you'll hear it. <laughs> when we go into questions, feel free to comment on the piano. But for now, for people who don't know. Well, you know, this is another thing. So I um, am a very bad pianist, but I love pianos. I mean, really love pianos. And I your daughter is musical. She's a cellist um, and um, very musical. My father was a marvelous, not just a physician, a phys sorry, phys physicist, but also a musician. Um, and uh, I wrote an entire book about a piano. I mean, I have this real love affair with pianos. My mother um, took up the piano at, at age 60. Um, and she's incredibly disciplined and determined. And, uh, and she just practiced every day and uh, had at one point three pianos and brought two of them to San Francisco. So I got rid of my piano. and. Uh, this is all sounding like a total shaggy dog story, but uh, the, her piano, she had this beautiful Steinway, um, which one can really only aspire to, that she had uh, bought from some um, inheritance, not from her parents, but from some friends of her parents. And, um, and she brought it up. She, I had plucked up the courage at one point to ask her if she would leave it to me someday, and she said she would put a codicil in her will. And um, and she then decided she was going to sell it. And I am so uh, kind of meek. I didn't say over my dead body. I sort of put up these sort of mild objections. And then um, one day, and Zoe <laughs> at one point, uh, was, Zoe was appalled at the thought that my mother was going to sell this piano, which I thought she had promised me, and I loved the feel of it. I mean, even with my clunky playing, I just it's this beautiful buttery action. Um, and I know a lot about pianos. I just loved it. And, um, and Zoe couldn't believe it. And at one point, and she couldn't believe that I was being so weak about it because my mother, you know, a lot of people are really scared to stand up to their mothers. And um, at one point, Zoe, who speaks her mind, said, Mom, she was getting, I drove her to school. She's getting out of the car, and she goes, just grow a tiny pair of testicles <laughs> and talk to your mother about the piano. So I go home and I try to bring it up and anyway, it, it gets into some other conversation. And so she, while Zoe and I were off looking at doing our little college tour when Zoe was a junior in high school, I get this email from my mother saying, well, the piano's gone and that was the end of the piano. And uh, it was sort of silly. I mean, it's a piano, right? But this is what I mean about it's sort of, that was our armoire. Mm -hmm. And your inheritance and, and many things, and many things, much more than a piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so overall, I know that um, you have some thoughts on what, very few of us have a perfect relationship with our mothers, with our parents, but... I know, could we have a show of hands? Anybody who has a perfect one? Oh, oh. lucky you! Lucky! That's so but, nice! But what do you, after all of this, what do you think about our obligation to our parents as they age, especially if there are, are deep flaws in the relationship? Well, what are your thoughts on that? You know, one thing I have to say, I, uh, so I did the, when the hardcover came out last summer, I went all over the country talking about that very question. I mean, I was giving book talks, um, and that question would come up over and over again. I mean, the central question of the book is, what is our obligation to our parents um, as they age, especially in my case, if they gave us a less than perfect childhood? And I come down really solidly on the side of, you know, our parents do the best they can, given what they had to work with. And uh, it's just what I believe, but you would be shocked. There were so many people who would come up to me or even just raise their hand in an audience and say, you know what, they are on their own. They were such bad parents. Sorry. But wait, no. you, you, you're not answering the question when you say they do the best they can. What is our obligation to them? Where do you come? You take care of them. Oh my goodness gracious. And um, I have, I'm actually working on a story right now for the Times about, um, it's, a, it's about elderly people who fall. And, uh, and I just 
witnessed a friend of mine whose mother just fell and watching the two of them interact has been so incredibly heartwarming. I mean, here's this, mo this woman who fell, she's in terrible pain um, and in terrible shape, fractured her hip and, you know, just watching the two of them is, is it's, it's, it, this is gonna sound ridiculous, but it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I mean. Because she's, she's taking care of her mother and her mother's. A wonderful mother and a w an amazing daughter, I mean, and that's to me i mean that was i've been watching them over the past couple of days and thinking this was my fairy tale and but not everything can you know not everyone has that and you can't force it well so i'm sure everybody it. wants to know your mother's reaction to the book and really <laughs> <laughs> And are you still able to take care of your mother? What's going on? Well, um, so her reaction was very um, negative. Uh, she, when I, uh, so when I got the contract um, to write the book, as I said, this kind of accidental book, um, I thought, you know, I had not read a, a primer on, you know, memoir writing, but I had a hunch that it was a good idea to ask people's permission, especially if you're living with them, um, that you'll be writing about like everything that happens. And um, so I went to both my mother and my daughter, and I said to Zoe, um, you know, I'm going to be writing about this year where Grandma Helen is living with us, and she's like so busy being a teenager. Yeah, Mom, whatever. And um, her reaction has been amazing. She, for a long time, she didn't want to read the book because it's very, very honest. I mean, I let no one off the hook in this book. Myself, my mother, my daughter. As I said earlier, that's the only way I think you can write a memoir is if it's really unflinchingly honest. And, um, and uh, she, Zoe did finally read it. We were on vacation once uh, and I had the, the bound galleys and I had them, I guess, in the living room in this place we were staying. And I came in one morning, and she's buried in the book. And she goes, Mom, this is really good. <laughs> and the day it came out, she texted me, and she said, I just want you to know how proud I am of you and how lucky I feel to be your daughter. And that was wonderful. When I told my mother I was writing the book, she had a very generous response. She said two things. She said, write what you want and I won't read it. And with that, that was liberating because otherwise, you know, if you're writing about people's lives, it can be <coughs> paralyzing if you're worried about how they're going to react. And um, so um, I did that and then she got nervous and she understandably um, wanted to see it. I showed her a big chunk of the manuscript and she reacted very badly. It was just, it's just been a real struggle for her, I think, for two reasons. I think part of it is what we talked about earlier, kind of this cognitive blackout. She just doesn't remember a lot of what happened. Um, so that's one thing, and it's incredibly hard to have that thrown in your face. And then, you know, this whole idea of, of how involuntary it is. You know, it's one thing for me to voluntarily hold a mirror up to myself and just you know, see the harsh sunlight come straight at me and it's ugly, um, and to write that. But then to hold a mirror up to somebody else and say, here, look at this, is, um, it's hard. So um, we're making little tiny steps. You know, one of our favorite things to do is, um, is exchange our favorite TV show stuff that happens. And so in The Good Wife, when, um, <laughs> I won't, unless, in case, you know. <laughs> so something happens in The Good Wife, and my mother had turned me on to that, and I, all I, I just wanted to tell her about it. And so this was very recent, and she texted me back, and you know, I think we're... Oh, good. Yeah. So one other question, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience. Um, as if it weren't enough what was going on with you and your daughter and your mother, a man comes into your life during this story, the He's wonderful Bob, for those of you who have read the story. The I love Bob. Bob. <laughs> So, um, and, and he is, is privy to a lot of what's going on, and he's just kind of a hero, I thought. Total hero. A total hero. Um, well, he kind of buffed a few sections to make sure. Ah. <laughs> so <laughs> what's going on with Bob? Well, so, yeah, I, met, I meet, right when I'm going down to, um, 
uh, to get her in San Diego, I've just started dating. I mean, I was so done with men, I can't even begin to describe it. And uh, these friends who live down the street from here had set us up on a blind date, and um, and they said, "Would you, you know, what are you doing with?" They called me. They said, "What are you doing about men?" And I said, nothing. <laughs> and they said, would you have dinner with this friend of ours who's gone through a really hard divorce? And I, I felt like it was like a charity act. I said, okay. And um, we sit down to have this, uh, to, to have this, uh, this date. Uh, and he, um, we were talking about this earlier, you know, he, Bob's very programmatic about life and pragmatic. And so he figured, he, you know, a lot of people who do these dates on like match.com and all this, they go for coffee so that you're not stuck. And, but you know, Bob would go for a full meal. It's like, and then he's smart enough that he would just, if he was bored to death, he would just amuse himself. And um, so he's, I was like the third, he, before, when he met me, uh, he had been out uh, with 32 different women and kept, kept a spreadsheet <laughs> and, and which I found incredibly endearing. And, uh, <laughs> And he knew like the whole first date protocol thing that you're supposed to do. And I uh, didn't, because since I'm binary, I'm either married or not married. That's sort of how my life is. And, uh, and so we sit down to this first date and, uh, and Bob gives me the carefully scripted thing about his marriage and it had lasted 20 years and they had gone their separate ways and all of that. And um, I, give, I just think you just are supposed to tell every, someone everything. So I did this whole data dump, you know, like alcoholic mother and dead husband, and, oh, <laughs> this husband, that her. By the time I was on like the third husband, he's, <laughs> the poor guy is like looking for an escape hatch. And amazingly enough, he, uh, he stuck with it. And uh, he, uh, maybe he was just, you know, the spreadsheet was full. I don't know. And, uh, and so we, um, a couple of years ago, we got married. And Yay! That's, that's the story. We rooted for Bob. I root. I root for Bob every day. All right. <laughs> well, and he obviously roots for you. So what we're going to do now is open it up to questions. Andy will have the microphone. But in the meantime, do you want to read this first or after the questions? I would love questions? to read. So thank you, you guys, for doing this. I don't know if you took a look at any of the others, but okay. <clears throat> so here are the. This is great. Um, matriarch, compassion. Selfish manipulator, bombastic, complicated, and then there's an arrow from selfish manipulator down to where it just says yes. <laughs> Pugnacious, competent, highly, fun, exclamation mark, quirky, selfless, and trapped. Oh my God. Mm. Strong, well-intentioned, but misguided distant, strong, che cheerfully pessimistic, <laughs> fiery, schizophrenic, emotionally immature, passionate, angry, miss her every day, oh. loving, perfectionist, parentheses, both in good ways and not so good ways, crafty, strong, it goes on. <clears throat> Love and complicated, resilient and lovely, spunky, confused, anxious, neurotic, self-proclaimed martyr, not mere <laughs> martyr, but self-proclaimed, terrifying, giving, glamorous, well-blown dry, <laughs> 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 passive, wonderful, gone, oh. empty, privately brilliant, embarrassing, ridiculously hardworking, unstoppable, strong, laughing, generous and fabulous, horrible, horrible narcissist, <laughs> and she died recently and still I feel guilty that I couldn't be nicer. No. Brave, too recently deceased, a lady, exclamation mark, undecipherable, loving, wounded, curious, adorable smoker. I don't know if adorable is <laughs> supposed to qualify smoker, but adorable and smoker. Smart slash funny, worried, reader, dynamic and devastating. Mm. Oh gosh, I can't read this one. 
I, so I'll skip it. Um, controlling yet loving, loving enabler, unfulfilled, narrow-minded, beautiful narcissist, generous loving, dependable, exploited, comma, underappreciated, mm. kind, comma, generous, comma, loving, comma, always understanding, mm. graciously inaccessible, <laughs> wow, <laughs> ball busting, <laughs> answers, self-centered, and forever. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Is anybody here with her mother tonight? Just curious. Oh, good. So you wrote loving, fabulous, all that kind of. <laughs> all right, all right, good. So questions or comments for Katie, please put up your hands. And there was something people wanted to comment on, but you will. So here comes Andy. Our first question right over here. So my name is Jennifer, and I'm really glad that I had an opportunity to read this book because of my awesome book club that's here. Uh, and I was the daughter of the mother-daughter me. And so I just I have to say, sorry, oh. mm. just having lived pretty much the whole book except from the experience of the daughter, including the alcoholic um, person in my family who happened to be my grandfather, it meant so much to me to hear the voice of the mother. Um, because I could never understand why she was so hard on my grandmother who has now passed away. But I did feel like from the perspective of the daughter that I knew more of what was going on that I felt like in some cases you gave Zoe credit for. Oh. And I'm just curious now that Zoe is an adult, if, if you've gotten more feedback from her in terms of did she really I mean, how much did she understand? She was a teenager, but I, I started my experience of living with my grandmother when, when I was six or seven, through the time that I left the house. And there were times when I was purposely mean because I was a teenager, and I knew exactly what was going on between the relationship of my mother and my grandmother. But I chose my position. Um, so I'm just curious. I know you've given a little bit of feedback in terms mm. of how Zoe's experience was, but. Did, did you get any of that feedback from her as now an adult looking back on her childhood years? Great do you question. mean, do you mean Zoe? Yeah, thank you so much for that. Wow, um, wow. Uh, do you mean Zoe? Uh, Zoe at 21 versus 15, what? Well, she's obviously, she's much wiser than she was. I mean, mm -hmm. she went through an impossible time after her dad died. She was quite impossible for a long time. I mean, she was, she was this child in grief, and she was mm -hmm. torn, and then this, her grandmother comes in, and she had been rejected by this man I married after her dad died. And, um, but now she, yeah, she has a wonderful distance, a kind of, she's, well, she's very, very, very wise. I mean, she's very, at one point I said to her, this isn't to do with my mother, but I said about the man I married <coughs> after her dad died, I said, sweetie, if you never, forgave me for marrying him, it would be too soon. And she said, Mom, your judgment was clouded. You were not thinking straight. And she does that a lot now. Um, and so, yeah, she's, um, but she's, she's also still not, um, she has not come to terms with the childhood my mother gave me which I now have, um, she just doesn't get it because I was so determined, you know, boy, did I overcompensate so sue me, you know, but that's what I did as a, as a mother to her. And, um, and that she has not. Do you think, I think part of the question too is, do you think Zoe understood more about what was going on than we perceive reading the book? Do you think... I, you know, that's such a good question. I don't know. I, I should ask, I'll get your email address. I'll <laughs> ask her because we haven't actually gotten into it much, but I'm, I'm sure she has a, has a wiser, you know, sort of sense of it now that she's. There, it's another question over there coming Audience around. question right here in the middle. Uh, I'm the person who wrote Horrible, Horrible Narcissist and my husband uh, bought me your book because I was struggling so much with my mother and I kept trying to understand how you could be so nice. And as I listen to you tonight, even though my mother died a few weeks ago, oh. I still can't get where you got. And I feel bad. Yeah. Because 
I don't have an excuse of alcoholic blackout. She was just a horrible person. My entire book club agrees. My mother, I win. <laughs> um, but I mean, she, there was never any reconciliation. She never was nice to anybody else. Oh. Oh. And so, um, and my children saw that, but I did take care of her physically. You did. I did, and uh, financially at some significant cost. But um, I wouldn't, uh, when my husband gave me this book and I said, did you see this? This crazy woman let her mother live with her. <laughs> and I was having trouble with a mother in Santa Clara. And so I felt, it, it made me feel bad actually. But um, I, so I have to say, I admire the reconciliation that you've come to, and um, I think you'll feel better when your mother dies so that you did, because I couldn't do it even though I wanted to do it, and your book book was so provocative for me. Um, so thank you for the book. Oh, gee, thank you. So so this is interesting though because um, I don't know if you have any insight into this, but I'm hearing about a mother who was just unremittingly horrible with nothing to soften it and no alcoholism or so where do we go with that i mean ex except to have compassion for your experience but i she sounds like my mother's mother who was unremittingly horrible and um i don't feel that about my mother i think she's a good person who and i love her and she had a bum deal, and um, it's very, everybody's situation is so, I mean, look at this list. I mean, so many different relationships. It's the most, for some reason, intrinsically fraught relationship. It's primal. I don't, I, I don't get it. Yeah. Anybody else? Here's a couple more, Andy. Hi. Thank you so much. I haven't read the book, but I'm definitely going to buy it tonight. <laughs> you get tea, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yay. Um, but I, I think just in responding to what the lady in the back of the room said, um, you know, I'm the one that said my mother was bombastic. And, you know, that's probably the tip of the iceberg. You know, I couldn't think of one word, so that was the best one. But <laughs> bless you. But I think what ha what happened for me is um, I just spent a lot of time in the last 10 or 15 years going to therapy to try to figure out my mother right. and my relationship because when my father died in 97, you know, it was just her and, you know, us kids. And my dad was always the one that took care of her, so now we were taking care of her ostensibly. So I guess the bottom line was I just wanted to come to terms with why I couldn't stand her so much. And um, it just takes a lot of work. I mean, it, you know, it, it really, I mean, that was really for five years, twice a week. That's all I talked about pretty much with my therapist. And I came to, in the last five or seven years, because my mom's been gone almost two years now, um, for the last six or seven years of her life, I, I understood her. And I loved her for who she was, not because she was my, was my mom. So, you know, you just, I think the therapy just helped me get some distance from this, you know, oppressive, you know, self-centered mother. Um, but when I knew about all the things that happened to her, she wasn't an alcoholic, but her father killed himself during yeah. the depression. See, there you go. And same thing, never a discussion in the family about it, no, you know, therapy in those days, no nothing. So she didn't even tell us. Um, so we had the same kind of thing where we were just always afraid to broach anything. I had to find out in college from my uncle that oh my, my grandfather didn't die of a heart attack. He, in fact, killed himself. And I still couldn't bring it up to my mom. So, I mean, there was obviously lots there to work with. <laughs> But the good news is that it, it helped. It made a huge difference. And I'm just, she's been gone almost two years, and I'm just so sad that I didn't get to know her sooner. Mm -hmm. So I would just urge everybody out there to, you know, it's never too late. 
start working on it now and and you'll never know what what good can come out of it. I mean, you can have a whole new relationship. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. I get a lot of people, <clears throat> thank you for that, I get a lot of people who come up to me and say, my life did not resemble yours at all, but this has just helped me sort of get it or start to get it or start to think about starting to get it. I saw some other Next hands here. Hi, my, mine's an easy one, and that was, you said you had two uh, portions of the book where you said, why the hell did you do that? But I heard about one. What was number two? <laughs> the, the other one was when you Thanks. thought you could, thank you, I, I was waiting for that. <laughs> okay, Katie, why did you think successfully you could take your mother and daughter shopping at the same time? <laughs> that drove me crazy. Oh, I know, <laughs> the, Blo the Bloomingdale's trip, when yes. she says, I'll take a taxi home. <laughs> it was classic. I mean, it a teenage just... girl and a mother in Bloomingdale's a setup. If and I Zoe ever... played me like an instrument. I, you know, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. It was, I just, it was just, that was a very early, my only defense is that that happened very, very early in her, our little experiment and um, we, it didn't happen again. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, you know, well, this brings up one thing and we'll, we'll take your question, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, that when you hear other people say, hey, I'm going to move my mom in, you um, advocate for a six-week test, right? Did I read that or did I make that up? You must have made that I up. I made that up. <laughs> it's I a good know. idea. Where did it come but from? You, I mean, six week test, but you mean you've got like this I don't know. I think apartment. I, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I dreamt it. That you, could, <laughs> that you could have some kind of, is there a way to? Well, here's what I think about that. I, I do get asked about that a lot. And I say, before you even think about doing anything like this, even moving your parent close to you, um, a lot of, in fact, uh, for this story I'm doing for the Times, I'm t talking to elderly people all the time, and so many people move to California to be from the East Coast to be close to their kid, to the, be close to their adult kids. Um, if you're thinking of moving, you know, your parent in, um, you have to start thinking about um, the the main thing is boundaries, you know, and we're talking about money boundaries and um, physical boundaries, but also little everyday things like. Does this mean that if I'm cooking dinner, she eats with us all the time? Or if I'm going out with friends, does mom come? And um, I just had no clue. It was all blurry to me. And the therapist had to really, I mean, that's what she really works on. So that's what I say to people, mm. not a test. I don't know where you got that, but it's, it's an idea. <laughs> and, um, but thinking it through, I mean, we, this was so ridiculously impulsive. That okay, a um, couple of more here. We have time for maybe two more. Well, when you asked for the descriptor, I said, well, when, then or now? Because what happens is my parents live to be very, very old. My father died at age 102. Whoa. And the father of the past was different than the father after the dementia set in. And the same thing with my mother. And uh, things just changed. I mean, when I was younger, my father had set up a will. Things were divided up among the three kids equally. This is the Armour story, okay? <laughs> and then later on, when he had become more demented, all of a sudden there was a new will where my brother got everything, oh you know? Gosh. And it just ended up being this huge family schism because it meant my brother was getting part of my sister's house. And, you know, they hadn't talked in 20 years. And this happened in this 20-year period between <laughs> pre-dementia and post-dementia. Mm. So it was hard to come up with a descriptor, and it was difficult. And the other thing that struck me was how different my sister's experience was from mine. Oh, My sister's yeah. description of my father yeah. would have been so different than mine, because That's I remember him as being remote, and he was polite, but he was remote and aloof, and I felt no connection. My sister remembers sitting on his lap, him teaching yeah. her how to paint. Amazing, yeah. I remember my mother doing all sorts of things for me. She has no memory of doing that. So, you know, between wow. the siblings, we yeah. have like, I mean, totally this, different parents. This, that's such a good point. This comes up a lot, is like, how is it that these, that siblings can, can one grows up to be completely, you know, damaged and has one kind of, uh, my sister just, she, I mean, she took care of me as a, when we were little girls, uh, and there we were just there was just a two-year difference, and I'm a classic survivor, 
And um, I was just talking to someone before this about research being done into this who and that it's they've decided it's largely genetic and um, and that you're programmed to survive, that I was programmed to survive and my sister wasn't. And then there's the there are the different memories. I was amazed I th always thought, you know, how kids they blame themselves for parents for their parents' divorce, and they'll blame. The, I blame myself always for the fact that we were taken away from her. And it turned out when my sister and I compared notes, she thought it was something she had done that caused that. And uh, it's that's actually it's a fascinating thing to to hear about. And it's just it's what it is. Last question. I think we had one over there. Um, well, I could probably comment um, a little bit about sibling differences, but I think there's been enough conversation about that. Um, maybe I'll just ask you about your role as journalist as opposed to your role as uh, author of a memoir and how you feel sitting up there speaking now and how that compares to your career as a journalist and do you feel like there's a real split between the two or do you feel like this has sort of enhanced some aspect of your journalism career? Wow, that's such a good question. I think it has... Um, I think the answer is no. I think I've, I mean, I've, this has been interesting to me to turn the lens on myself, but it hasn't, I don't think it's made me a better journalist, a worse journalist. It's just something, it's a shift, it's different. Um, I, uh, I, I thought, I, when I went back to do some big pieces, app, some big journalistic pieces after this, I thought it might affect how I worked, but it, it actually, it hasn't. Hmm. Even the, the big story with, with elderly people falling because it's so close. Well, the, oh yeah, well that's, yeah, especially watching, you know, my friend interact with her mom and it's so incredibly uh, touching. Um, yeah, I, but that's different. I mean, that's, uh, but I'm still a journalist. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. still observing and, um, but but then but then I stand back and I think you know I wish uh, I had that. But okay. Well, I want to remind you, um, Ingrid's here selling books. Katie will sign them. There's Mighty Leaf Tea. You can share your stories with her. Thanks to all of you for coming, and mostly thanks to Katie Hafner. <laughs>